This is the very first message that he laid on my heart tonight, and it, it deals with prayer. And so some of this may be a repetitive, but um, I believe God desires to impress us with this truth. Amen. This absolute fact that if we do not establish an altar in our life, if we do not truly commune with God, if we don't walk closely with Him, if we don't know Him, then sooner or later we will misrepresent Him. We will misrepresent Him. Reading in Matthew 6 and verse 6, the words of Jesus, very familiar verse here. It will come as no surprise. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. I thought tonight the key to public ministry the key to public ministry. Would you stand with me one more time? Just take a moment. Lift your hands. Ask for the Holy Ghost to speak to us. Open your heart to receive the Word of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, Father God, Father God. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, God. Jesus, Jesus. Oh, God. Father, I pray, Lord, for your fear here tonight, O God. We need you, Lord God. We need this word, Father God. Draw us unto yourself, Father. Give us eyes to see, Lord God. We pray tonight, Father God, for eyes of... Reveal Yourself to us, Lord God. I know this is Your Word, Father. And Lord, I ask You here tonight, visit us in the name of Jesus Christ. For His name's sake and because of Jesus, have mercy upon us, Lord God. Even Jesus touched the blind man twice that He might see. Touch us here tonight twice. With this word, O oh God, that we may recover our sight, O oh God. Draw us into your presence, Father. I ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Now this we know. True gospel preaching is far more than intellectual communication. Mere words affect men's minds, but preaching is intended by God Almighty to expose the heart. Some men speak to appeal solely to human reason. Others seek to stir deep emotions. But the gospel preacher's aim is to awaken the human conscience. Amen. As the apostle Paul wrote by the Holy Ghost, by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And thus the gospel's influence is confirmed not by the sinner's feelings, nor by his preferences or approval, but by his tormented conscience. I had a man today come and approach me, a campus minister, and he told me, he said, I don't mind when you people come out here If you want to talk to students about eternity, talk about their soul. 
but it offends me. I'm against you preaching here. And I asked him, sir, listen to what you're saying. Are you opposed to preaching when the word of God says, how shall they hear without a preacher? And he went on to communicate that people were offended. He said, you're turning people away from Christianity rather than winning souls. No wonder the church is in the shape she's in in America when men who call themselves preachers don't even know what to expect. Amen. When the gospel is is preached. They don't even know what the effect and the influence of the word of a supernatural God, a transcendent holy God. What will happen when that word falls upon sinful flesh? We're a naive and a shallow bunch. Amen. There needs to be a restoring of truth. Ian Bounds said all forms of sin and wickedness grow up and luxuriate under the eye and voice of preaching that never disturbs conscience nor awakens opposition. The preaching that has no repellent power will have no attractive force. The preaching that is not direct in its aim is a blank cartridge fired in the air. You know, I don't just go out there to be opposed. That's not my goal. It shouldn't be yours just to be opposed, trying to make somebody mad. But I'm here to tell you, I I expect when sinful men, amen, when the darkness is confronted by the light, there is going to be a clash. Some sparks are going to fly in the spirit, amen. Let the church truly preach Christ and wicked men everywhere will confess for the great and terrible day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand. Gospel preaching is divine utterance projected to strike at the moral center of man supercharged with heart piercing Holy Ghost unction but let us understand here tonight such utterance is completely beyond human fabrication or human origin it cannot be mustered up it cannot be mimicked you're not going to hear it and just simply repeat it it is a supernatural function of the Holy Ghost joined with redemption deemed and holy men. There's no other formula. There's no other way. Amen. And listen to me. Amen. It's not man speaking about God. It's God speaking through man that has been redeemed. This is our obligation. Literally to bring God and His Word into enemy territory. Literally to bring God. God. The person of God. And the Word of God. That Christ would be manifest and brought into enemy territory. You know, if I were to bring a picture of Osama bin Laden, he's a known enemy of the American citizenry. Every one of us knows that he's a murderer, that he's a terrorist. But if I were to bring his picture here tonight, I could run up and down the aisles and say, boo, Osama bin Laden is here, and nobody would take me very seriously. But if I open that back door... And he walked in. Fear would strike the heart. Fear would strike the heart. Amen. We can't just bring a character of God out there. God must be manifested. God must come down and walk among us. The presence of God must be real. It must be real in us, through us, and with us. And that doesn't happen by accident. It's not just going to happen one day. We're not going to talk about it enough and then one day stumble upon it. Amen. We're going to have to do what the Word of God commands us to do. This and this alone constitutes gospel preaching this and this alone it constitutes gospel preaching if we fail here we cannot fulfill the great commission we cannot we must do as it's recorded in first peter preach the gospel with the holy ghost sent down from heaven what is the key to such divine and supernatural utterance I don't believe it's a mystery to anyone. I think every single one of us 
already knows exactly what we should be doing. Every single one of us knows that. I believe the answer is found. In the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's going to confirm what the Holy Ghost has told us over and over and over and over and over and over again. Moment by moment. Day by day. Month by month. Melding into years and decades. As the Holy Ghost says, seek my face and live. Seek my face and live. And let me tell you something. This applies to every facet and every sphere of Christianity. Not just evangelism. You want to homeschool your children? You need the anointing of the Holy Ghost of God. Amen. You want to be a good employee? You need to be filled with the Holy Ghost and walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In every area of life. Amen. The only way we're going to find it here. This is the pattern. Three simple but very obvious things communicated in our text. First of all, prayer is a command, not an option. Prayer is a command, not an option. Prayerlessness is sin. Do we believe that? Will we call sinners to forsake their sin while we live in sin? Prayerlessness is sin. But thou, when thou prayest. Notice, when we pray, not if we pray. Can we demand that sinners draw nigh to God while we stand afar off? Do we have the right to place upon sinners... The divine obligation, amen, the divine commandment to draw nigh to Him and to know Him if we don't know Him. And I do recognize that regeneration, to be born again, is to come into contact, to have fellowship, to be, you know, grafted into the vine, to become a son of God. And I'm not denying a man be born again in a second. He doesn't have a prayer life other than the prayer of repentance that he's prayed, but he does know God. But, you know, first of all, we're to be apprehended by God. But every one of us knows the Scriptures teach we are to take that yoke upon us. We are to learn of the Lord Jesus Christ. Regeneration is not the end of salvation. It's the beginning. We are to learn Jesus Christ. We are to study Him. I mean that in an intimate way. We are to walk with Him. And we are to be, you know, in union with Him. Our heart knit with His heart. Amen. It is a command, not an option. You know, we often hear Christianity described as a personal relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. And so it is. And yet, who ever heard of a relationship void of communication? If I rarely spoke to my wife, how could I refer to my marriage as healthy? You know, if you approached my wife during this conference and said, Oh, you and Brother Brid look like you have such a good relationship. Uh, you must spend hours to, together just sharing your heart. Oh, no, I, I barely speak to my husband just, you know, a few moments each week. You think you would walk away? from that conversation and think, now that's a model marriage. Wouldn't you think that there's something grossly amiss? Wouldn't you think that that Mary, how could it even survive this long? Amen. Wouldn't you suppose that whatever you could see, amen, in the external, whatever you understood about the marriage from the limited information that you had, just, you know, uh, coming in contact with us day in and day, if you knew that there was very little intimacy, wouldn't you think that it's all a charade and all a facade? And yet we have a covenant likened to marriage with Jesus Christ. We must be made to see as Christians, as Christians, our first obligation is to know, love, and minister to God. Amen. You read through the law and you see in those ceremonial dictates, 
all the different, you know, laws and structures and standards for the priesthood. And you see these words, that they may minister unto me. That they may minister unto me. That they may minister unto me. To love Him. To worship Him. To enter in. To adore. Amen. To fellowship and commune with God is our first obligation. We must see if we have no heart to minister to God Don't be deceived. We cannot truly have a heart to minister for Him. This standard must be applied to our own life with severity, without exception. This is how we are to judge ourselves. We're not to be deluded. Amen? We're not going to just be hearers of the Word. Pray, 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 and then don't pray and believe. Amen? We're going to escape self-deception, do we? Don't be deluded. You may have zeal. You may have knowledge. But if you don't have a heart to minister, and if I don't have a heart to minister unto God, then I really don't have a heart to minister for Him. If we have little or nothing to say to God, we have little or nothing to say for Him. Oh, yes. It didn't amaze me. I've seen it for years as a pastor. Folks want to preach. They'll talk. They'll talk a year off all night. They'll talk to men around during a prayer meeting, though. They check out the patterns of the carpet. Hardly hear them see their mouth moving. They got nothing to say to God. And if you've got nothing to say to Him, you're not going to have anything to say for Him. Amen. Remember Jesus said, What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in the light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. We cannot shout what we do not hear. We cannot shout what we do not. Listen, wait before God and hear. You know, think about it. The ability to speak is conditionally linked to the ability to hear. That's why deaf people can't say anything. Amen. That's why man if he loses his ability to hear before long he cannot audibly or articulately speak amen if you're going to speak from God you're going to have to be willing to wait and listen to him and if you won't wait patiently before God are you going to expect them to sit there and patiently wait and listen to God speak through you to them you reap what you sow we reap what we sow Amen. If we refuse to allow God to whisper in our ear, He is not going to put a word in our mouth. Listen, saint of God, when the prayer meeting is laborious, when it's lost its appeal, when prayer is difficult, the question is not, am I qualified to evangelize? Do you suppose God will still use me? Uh, Can I preach still? No, the question is, who will evangelize you? Who will God send to preach to you? That we would even consider if we're prayerless. That we, you know, really would, we're deceived if we believe that there's really much that God can do with this. Amen. Do we believe this? The Bible teaches it. I said the Bible teaches it. Amen. The question, amen, we need to ask ourselves, are we truly seeking the Lord? Think about it. Jesus' sacrifice upon Calvary. Calvary, among other things, made it possible for you and I to have communion with God. Do we squander that great and universal privilege? Think about, is there a greater privilege that a human being could be given than an open door into the presence of Almighty God? Amen. What does reconciliation to God mean if it does not mean being brought back into fellowship and communion with God. And then that being true, can we have the ministry of reconciliation if we show little fruit of it ourselves? Are we just here to get people to join the church? Do we just want people to believe like we do? 
Is that what we're after? I know we're not. I'm trying to provoke thought here. If we cannot bring men face to face with God, where they have a relationship with Him, where they commune with Him, where they serve Him and obey Him, then what are we doing? That is the aim of the gospel. Reconciling men unto God. And if I myself, amen, am not enjoying the blessing of that reconciliation, or rather, if I am squandering that blessing, then I think self-examination is in order. How can we reconcile sinners to a God that we barely know? You know, it's an awful thing, a tragic thing. It's unfortunate that I have to say this. But as a pastor over the years, I've come to learn many times I'm attempting, pleading, you know, pleading with people to love of God they don't even really like and I don't want to spend any time with him unless you fall down and weep hey man they can't even exhibit any appreciation you can scream the blood the cross the lamb death burial resurrection and people are barely moved even to lift up their hands we're pleading with people, amen, to love a God they don't even want to spend time with. They don't even really like Him. No heart to seek Him. Amen. No, no real desire, amen, for what, you know, His heart and for His mind. Oh, they want what He has. They want what He'll give. They want the blessings, but they don't want the person of God. You see, listen to me, all of us. I don't care who you are, me, you, any Christian that's ever lived. We must bring ourselves under this standard. We must be honest with ourselves. Or we'll be self-deluded. Likewise, I'm convinced if we have little fervency in prayer, then more than likely our evangelistic zeal is counterfeit. It's fueled by either the flesh or some other selfish consideration. We're administering to our own ego, amen, if we think that we're zealous to talk to men when we have no desire to really talk to God. There has to, listen to me, the motivations are the same. The grace of the same grace, amen, that will bring you to your knees in prayer will bring you to your feet in evangelism. You cannot separate the two. You know, if I were to meet a very bold preacher who is very uh, orthodox in his doctrine, and uh, you know everything that he said, I agree with. And listen to me, what I'm telling you here, I'm not exaggerating. I believe this with all of my heart and I walk according to this rule. If I met such a man and I knew that he was orthodox, I agreed with all of his theology. I brought him on the street. Amen. He spoke like an angel. Amen. Hair on the back of my neck stood up every time he spoke. Amen. He was uh, had wonderful things to say when he witnessed the people. He was bold in the face of danger. But if I brought him at a prayer meeting and he twiddled his thumbs, I would take notice. Be careful! Something's wrong with that. You hear me? And I wonder if the average LSU student who hear the excitement, the zeal, the anger against sin, all good. Don't think for one moment I'm attacking any of that. The passion. If that student visited our prayer meeting, What would he say? We sit down. We find someone. We want to instruct them. We want to tell them about God. We find even some charismatic that's confused in their theology. We're quick to begin to teach them. But I tell you what. Any charismatic worth his salt, if they're really born again. Amen. I was once a charismatic. I got born again. And when I was three months old in God, if someone would have sat down and told me all the truth, and I'd have went there and a man would have stared at the carpet during a prayer meeting, I would have run for my life. And I'd have been right to do so. I'd have been right to do so.
I would have run as fast and as hard as I could away from Listen to me, the, own, the, the church that I was discipled in, my own church, they canceled their prayer meetings. I used to have a prayer meeting in the morning with some young men that were in a terrible, awful church. Listen to me, no excuses. It was horrible. It was sin. The whole church was under the judgment of God. But those three or four, five, six young men, Charlie, they were Charlie's age. There were several of them that were really born again. And one day the associate pastor, Pastor called me in the office. I had a lot of influence with him. And he said, why don't you, you know, basically proselyte those young men and bring them over here. They're in that horrible place. I said, listen to me. If I went to a church and I opened the pages and put my finger down, found a church and went there and they didn't have a prayer meeting, I would never go there. Never. I don't care how good the preaching was. I don't care how much clothes I got on. You cancel that prayer meeting, friend. No prayer meeting there. And it's the same with the individual life. Amen. An absence of prayer means deadness to God. Absence of prayer means deadness to God. Amen. But listen to me. Our zeal, it's counterfeit if we don't have a desire and a passion for prayer. I realize you're not always going to feel like praying. Don't mistake what I'm saying. I don't know. There are many times. I don't have. I, in fact, it's been, you know, such that God has brought me to a place I don't know how to describe it amen there's a difference between sensing God and feeling God you sense God by faith by faith it's separate than feelings I appreciate feelings I have them sometimes but there are lots of times I don't have any feelings amen but I do and can sense God by faith because I know that He is. I know that He, I know that through Jesus Christ, the blood is effectual. I can talk to Him. I can get before God. I can come before His presence. His ear is open to the righteous because Jesus shed His blood that I could. You must believe and draw nigh unto God. But there must be that altar established. We disesteem the command to pray at our own peril, for prayerlessness is sin. Amen. Jesus spoke the parable of the unjust judge to teach us what? To this end, that men ought to always pray and not to faint. Always to pray. It is a command. Next, amen. Do we have a secret history with God? Do we have a secret history of God? Is there a log in heaven where God can say, when no one was looking, when no one was paying attention, it wasn't the corporate prayer meeting. No, no, it was just me and her. It was just me and him. Do you have such a history with God? You know, I have moments with my wife, many such moments, because we are intimate. Amen? And I can think back in my marriage, and there are special times that I've had. I have a long history with my wife. Amen? And so likewise, there should be that record with you and your God. Moments of secrecy where no one else knows. You know, Little Raven Hill said, he said, theoretically, there's three types of people in every time in every one of us there's the one we think we are there's the one that we want people to think we are and there's there's the one that god knows that we are amen and you know often we live in a fantasy world only you know driven to prop up our spiritual reputation before others but god is looking at the secret place god is looking at that history that you have with him alone amen i'm not here to say that the corporate prayer meeting is not important very 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 important but more important than anything is your personal intimacy with god almighty amen what we are in reality is defined before god in that secret place at the altar i want you to listen to me here amen god is talking to us what i am and what you are in reality is there in that secret place before God. Nothing more, nothing less. What we are in the Spirit is what we possess there. That's it. It defines us.
Thus the man who desires to represent Jesus in evangelism must see the absolute necessity to establish a private altar before God. The man who neglects our son's secret prayer will never be able to truly stir up the gift of God. If we fail in the ministry of prayer, we will never be effective in the ministry of evangelism. As one wise sage said, giants in prayer are discovered in public but they are made in private amen a shunned altar essentially is the root of an empty heart as mr bound so bluntly stated the men of preaching hearts are only preachers of prayerful hearts sadly many times men are all ablaze to preach to sinners but hesitant to intercede for them this ought not to be this ought not to be something is out of kilter when we see this amen again i'm not saying that we don't have to discipline ourselves there's not times, amen, that we have to take ourselves, as it were, by the hand and say, okay, self, I should be praying for the people I preach to. But you know, in my experience, I've seen exactly the opposite. People love to preach. They love to tell people, you know, they're wrong, they're going to hell, but there's real, no, really no burden for the glory of God and for the souls of men. Amen. We can never be anointed if we refuse to walk closely with God. We must see. Preaching doesn't hinge on eloquence or oratory skill. No, no. It stands or falls alone on the ground of the anointing. On the ground of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Mr. Bound said again, It is not great talents that God blesses so much as great likeness to Jesus. A holy minister is an awful weapon in the hand of God. Amen. We must seek God. We must, listen to me, we must have the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. We must hunger to know Him. You know, over the years, I haven't been saved that long just really a short time in comparison to other men I don't have really a whole lot of experience but I have worked with different preachers and without exception all those men that had divine authority every one of them were men of prayer there was never an exception there was never an exception to that rule and those who didn't you could tell they somehow lightly esteemed it or thought they could have void or otherwise bypass the altar amen perhaps they never really prayed through in their need never faced the reality i must seek the lord but maybe at one time they did seek god and then fell away but you know i sat under three different pastors i stand in this pulpit tonight grieved by the spirit of god to tell you that all three of them are backslid and you can trace it i believe to a forsaken an altar they may have survived for years it doesn't happen overnight but sooner or later it will be our downfall such men go on in their so-called ministry with little or no flu influence. Their preaching is often dry, clinical, even rehearsed. Preaching more from a head filled with knowledge rather than a heart filled with the Holy Ghost. Rather than a voice for God, they become simply an echo of the voice. Mere purveyors of second-hand revelation. Amen. Listen to me. We were talking about this, uh, Kevin and I just, I believe this afternoon or yesterday, Yesterday about people, you know, repeating others. We all repeat people. Amen. We're all really just the product of a thousand tributaries. It's I'm quoting men here tonight, but there's a difference. Listen to me. When you know that God has given something to you directly, and you must that is the word of the Lord. And without the word of the Lord, men will perish doesn't matter whether you're going to LSU 
or you're a pastor of the church, you must have what God wants to say to those people right now through you. You must have that. Amen. Throughout the scriptures, we read declarations like the word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel. Don't think for one moment he didn't know that. Amen. He knew, oh, I must speak. God is talking to me. God has given me something to say. And only in that scenario, only with a burdened heart like that, do we find such utterances as the Apostle Paul when he said, Woe be unto me if I preach not the gospel. He knew he had a responsibility. He knew the hand of Almighty God was upon him. And God had given him something to say. And he had to say it. He had to say it. Such must it be with you and I. Even when we go into the highways and the byways. I can remember as a young man in a local church, submitted there. Amen. And I knew that God had called me to that campus. Amen. I knew it. It wasn't something I did as a hobby. It wasn't something I did every once in a while. It was besides Jesus, my life. It was my life. I was burdened night and day. I fasted. I prayed. I sought God. What do you want me to say? What do you want me to say tomorrow there in front of that union? It's the same pattern as I have now. You know, I, I still have an obligation, amen, to be an evangelist, to preach the gospel. But my main primary function now in the body is as a pastor. So I'm constantly thinking of burdened with God's speaks to me in light of that call. Listen to me, street preacher. Listen to me, open air evangelist. Is that the way it is with you? It must be. It must be. You must be a mouthpiece of God to that community wherever you're at. God indeed will send you. God commands you to go. But you must see it's not just something. You do a little spiritual exercise on a Saturday afternoon. You must seek the Lord for that word that he will give expressly unto you. Amen. We're all going to repeat people at times. But the essence of God's call demands that he literally speaks through us. The man called of God realizes early on he must not rely on talent, past experience, knowledge, wit, or even zeal, but on the anointing of the Holy Ghost. You know, an ambassador, he's confident because he comes from the presence of the king with the word of the king. He doesn't go on his own authority. He doesn't go on what the king has said ten years ago. He goes on what the king said when he came out of his presence right then. That's what produces that divine authority. It's easy to believe. It's easy to speak for God when he really does speak to you. It's that simple. It really is effortless to speak for God when He really does speak to you. Because it's the will of God. And it's real. You experience it. Even to be sincere, to be honest, to be earnest and even zealous is not enough. God's presence, God's power and unction must be upon us. And the anointing and the unction of the Holy Ghost can only be secured in one place. Again, Mr. Bound said prayer, much prayer is the price of preaching unction. Prayer, much prayer is the one sole condition of keeping this unction. Without unceasing prayer, the unction never comes to the preacher. Without perseverance in prayer, the unction like the manna overkept breeds worms. Well, what will we do? If we pray a lot, we'll beg God and He'll finally release some Holy Ghost anointing to us? No. All the windows of heaven have been unlocked by the key of the cross. 
And the hinges of those doors have been oiled with the blood of Jesus Christ. The windows of heaven are open to every soul here tonight. Only believe. Only believe. But you can only believe as you pray through to the place where you know He is. And He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Prayer doesn't change God. It changes us. It changes us. Amen. We must have the anointing. One of the most difficult yet essential spiritual lessons we must learn is this. We are not God. We're not God. Amen. And I can tell you, you ask most people, they say, well, of course, I know that. Then don't act like Him. Amen. Don't act like you can handle it on your own. Don't be self-sufficient. If we believe that we can do nothing apart from Jesus, then we will make sure that we abide in the Lord Jesus Christ. Anything less, anything less means that we have succumbed to unbelief. Amen. It's an amazing thing that people can hear about pray. We, we, we're a people that would be, you know, revival people. We read the books. We know there needs to be a move of God. We talk about it one with another. Those are all good things, all wonderful things, and all very provoking. Amen. But if it doesn't compel us to seek God, then it's all for naught. And the amazing thing is that you can hear, you know, in the church in this hour, people can hear messages like this. And the next prayer meeting, it looks like they're counting the number of bricks in the wall. They're passive in the spirit. The kingdom of God suffereth violence. And the violent take it by force. Amen. You're not going to get through by staring at the ground. Amen. I've been using this analogy with our church and much of which I'm I'm preaching here tonight. I've been preaching to us because we need it. But you know, you go out on the street and you arrive on campus and they turn the stereo up and it's very loud. And we don't, what do we do? Charlie, they turn the music up. We'll never be able to preach out here. Let's just go into the house. Or perhaps we go sit on the wall. It's too loud to preach to anybody. I'm just going to sit here. (laughs) I don't feel anything. And it's no use to me even saying anything. I'm not going to get through. What do we do? We gird up our loins. And we resist the devil. Do that in your prayer closet. Hey, man. When you kneel at that altar, amen, and the heavens seem to be brass, and there seems like a thousand devils, amen, singing its rap music in your ear, every distraction, defy the devil, defy the devil, defy the devil in the name of Jesus Christ. It is a principle, an unchanging principle, amen, for victory. You must resist the devil. Submit yourself to God. Subject yourself to the Word of God. God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You must learn to do that. But people passively float. Amen. They come into a prayer meeting. Amen. They won't even hardly open their mouth. Amen. You're going to have to fight the devil. Turn your face into the demonic wind and defy it. That's how you're going to get the victory, friend. How many times have you gone on the street and they're screaming and it's almost a demonic conspiracy. And as you choose to set your face like Flint towards Zion, you get a breakthrough from God. And suddenly the windows of heaven are open and there's an articulation. Amen. The mysteries of Christ somehow begin to flow through this vessel of clay as you submit yourself to God. I never knew, amen, that I could talk like that. It's not you talking like that. It's the Holy Ghost talking through you like that. And He will pray through you like that if you will let him he'll pray through you like that but you have to give yourself to him amen no we're not God apart from Jesus without exception we will be reckless and hopelessly dangerous 
And that is the truth. That lesson of learning I'm not God, we also learn what we are apart from Him. You know, I'm a holiness preacher. I believe in heart purity. I believe in living above sin by the grace of God. But only in as much as I am in Christ. Amen. Any virtue, any purity, any holiness in me or you, it's Jesus and his life in and through us. And one step, one breath outside of Christ is 10,000 miry traps of clay, a million delusions to the mind. None of us can survive outside of Jesus. Listen to me. If we believe that, we will be afraid to find ourselves outside of him. Amen. If we're going to plan to preach, we must also plan to pray. We've heard the saying, you don't plan to pray. Amen. You're not going to pray. You don't plan to preach. You're not going to preach. Amen. But I tell you what, let's be real. You know, on a Friday night, we're going on the street. That's what we're going to do. And even though, listen to me, I realize sometimes we're going through the motions. Amen. To my shame, I have to admit that. But we still go. We still lift up our voice. Many times that's why we do get a breakthrough. Because even God in His mercy, as we externally, amen, go through, God will come and help us. In prayer, in worship. You know, listen to me, worship is for Him. And you know, listen, the days, especially Pentecostals, I don't feel nothing. You know why they want to minister to me, me. I want to feel. I want, what if you feel anything? Well, you're supposed to be ministering to him. It's a sacrifice. A sacrifice. Offer up a sacrifice. Come in and minister unto him. You know, these ladies, they're serving food. They're, they're ministering unto us, right? Amen. You know, it's not like getting a massage. Amen. It's not like taking a jacuzzi bath. It's work. It's labor. It requires something of them to minister unto us. And when we come to work, we minister unto God. And it's true. He inhabits the praise of His people. And He will come in His power and in His tangible presence. And the yoke will be destroyed. But first and foremost, we have to realize, we have to come and worship Him in spirit and in truth. And it is a ministry unto Him. You know, if I came tonight and told uh, one of you, I will give you a million dollars to hold a conversation nonstop with a complete stranger for two hours, every one of you would have the ability to do it. You'd get it done. Amen? You'd talk. Amen? That mouth would be moving. You're not going to stop. And if I said, be, you know, share the secrets of your heart, I believe most of you would be willing to do that. And yet there's a door swung wide open in eternity into the presence of a Father that owns the whole universe. The whole universe open to us. You see, it's the cloaking of the eyes and the dullness of hearing. The deadness to God. The lack of circumcision of ears, eyes, and heart. If we just simply see Him as He is, we will be drawn into His presence. Who wouldn't come to this God that's been cleansed by the blood? What an invitation to know, to love, and to enjoy this God. And finally, here tonight, a secret life of prayer will reap open reward. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. The key to open air ministry is a secret history with God. A very personal a very private and hidden experience where we have prayed through to the reality that He is our Father and that every need is provided in the Word according to the Lord Jesus Christ. No one else can go there for you and no one else can go there for me. Your pastor is not going to bring you there. 
your husband, your wife, your parent, your brother, your sister, your good friend. No, no, you're going to have to choose to go there yourself. There are no shortcut, quick fix, cut rate, bargain anointings. No, no. We're not the exception. We're not going to become spiritual by accident. We're not just going to wake up one day with heavenly authority. Just, oh, well, I've talked about it enough, and now God has come. It will never, never, never happen until you meet the condition. Never. If we're to speak for God instead of about Him, then we must pay the price. No doubt God will help us. No doubt God will help us. He wants us to talk to Him. He wants us to share everything. He wants us, amen, to cast every care at His feet. He wants to commune. He wants to walk with us in the cool of the day. He wants, and listen to me, There's no, you were fashioned, you were shaped for that fellow, and there's nothing, nothing in this universe like it. One moment in the presence of God will destroy every bondage. Every bondage. It'll open the mind. Amen. To the truth of God. It will unveil the deep secrets of the holy transcendent God where man can peer into eternity and see the living almighty Christ. There is nothing. Nothing in human experience that could compare to that. Nothing at all. And it's all open to every single child of God. Every one of us. Amen. He's just on the other side of the veil. The amazing thing in my own experience, when I've fallen asleep, you can't maintain, you can't retain spiritual spirituality in your intellect. You can't do it. You just, before you know it, you're blind. I mean, before you know it, you're blind. And then you press it, and the lights are turned on. And he was just right across the veil. Just right there. The only way you can touch him is by faith. You have to reach to him by faith. The only way. And faith must believe that he is. Faith cometh to God. Faith believes and faith seeks him diligently. Even with tongue and vocal cords, human utterance is impossible apart from the intelligence of the human mind. And likewise, God's open revelation only comes to those who diligently secure his most intimate thoughts. We must seek him while it's called day. We must seek him. While we can. Why don't you stand with me tonight? I'm going to close with this thought. We were in prayer recently at a prayer meeting. And God began to deal with me. He began to burden my heart with my own lack of spirituality. He began to grieve me for the lack of spirituality in our church. And during that prayer meeting, he just spoke to me. And I jotted down, I wrote down what he said to me. Listen. The spirit of prayer is the single most telling indicator of the quality of spirituality we possess. If we have little heart to pray, if prayer is laborious, if it is difficult to enter in, to stir ourselves to intercede, supplicate, or worship. The ebb of spiritual life is wanting. If when we should be basking by faith in the presence of God, we tend to be restless, unfocused, or God forbid bored, then we are in grave danger indeed. We dare not be deluded into believing we are spiritual or even secure, if ours is the case. Sadly, religious activity is often mistaken or substituted for true spirituality. It is often used in a vain attempt to appease a condemned conscience. 
or soothe the dried and drifting spirit with the counterfeit balm of dead works. The prayerless are sometimes unconsciously driven to bustle about, to stay busy, to keep moving, lest they experience an uncomfortable moment in the presence of an unfamiliar God. If we freely talk to men but are discomposed before God, let us not be self-deceived. We are in deep trouble. If we are busy but barren, active yet aloof, perhaps it's time to step aside, stop, and press back into God's presence. We need to return to our first love, casting ourselves afresh on the rock of Christ, lest the fires of the holy altar be extinguished. The altars are open. Seek God, church. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Seek the Lord while he may be found.